Amen. Good morning. Good to see you here on Palm Sunday. So, you know, I'm going to start out with a story. Uh, because of all the grandchildren children in my life, I have lots of stories to tell. But uh, my one granddaughter, my oldest, uh, called me during the week. And so, so this is how she talks to me. So I, I'm going to just tell you how the conversation went. So the phone rings, I answer. She goes, Grandpa. And I go, Katie. Grandpa, Katie. And it goes back and forth for a little while. And she goes, is it Palm Sunday? I said, yes, Palm Sunday is coming up this coming Sunday. Okay, Grandpa, do you have any palms that you're going to have there? Any palm leaves? I'm like, uh, no. Well, don't you think there should be palm leaves there? I'm like, it is Palm Sunday. All right, well, Katie, what do you got in mind? She goes, I'll look after it. It's okay, Grandpa. So here's what we have right here is the palm tree that's been created to be here for Palm Sunday. Now, I got yelled at after the first service because she has made this a special tree. She made it so that the leaves are detachable, so that they can be waved. So she said, Grandpa, make sure you show everybody that this thing works, all right? So here you are, all right? They're being waved. There they are. But uh, God bless her, amen? Amen. You know, we are going to be talking about the importance of Palm Sunday, you know, the, the Passion Week or Holy Week. You know, I think I, I like the word passion, and, and Donnie said that. And the reason is, the whole reason for Jesus coming to the earth was for him to give his life. And so that's why the last week is called the Passion Week, because it, it's his primary reason. In other words, he lived, he lived, he lived to die, and then to live again. And so it's really important for us to realize that Jesus came to not only die and live again, but to die and live again so you could live as well. And this is just so, so important. So as we're looking at the, the story, the account of what's happened, I want you to begin to ask this question, what's in this for me? What, what, what is Jesus saying to me? In fact, the title, the main title is When Jesus Rides In. So I'm actually going to give you, in a sense, the conclusion now. If you feel you need to go home, you can. But uh, then we're going to back up, in a sense, and talk about why I'm giving you this conclusion. And it's this, that if Jesus rode into Jerusalem some 2,000 years ago, to, to make an impact there, let me tell you something. He's still riding in today into your life and into mine, and he wants to make a difference as well. And so we're going to talk today about seven truths that you need to know about Jesus as he rides into your life and in mine. Amen? So if you have your Bibles, uh, I'd like you to, or your apps, however you want to go, go uh, Matthew chapter 21. I'm going to read several verses from here. Matthew 21, beginning at verse 1. Now as they drew near Jerusalem and came to Bethpage at the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me. And if anyone says to you, you shall, you shall say, The Lord has need of them, and immediately he will send them. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, lowly and sitting on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. Verse 6. So the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them, and brought the donkey and the colt, laid their clothes on them, and set him on them. And a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road, and others cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the multitudes who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? So the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. So as we, how many people have heard that account before? I would think most of you have been in church any length of time. You've heard this, you know, a thousand different times. But here's the thing. I want to look at it maybe a little different, from a little different perspective today. And for us to do that, we need to understand context. You know, when I went to Bible school years ago, the, the one teacher would say, context is king. You know, or, or context bleeds the meaning of the scripture you're looking at. With the idea that what's around what you're reading has truth that helps you understand what you are reading. And so let me tell you the context of this a little bit as I've looked at the four Gospels and, and compared them. Just before the triumphal entry, a couple things happened. First of all, blind people were healed of their blindness. That was a big thing. You can read that in the Gospels. Another thing that happened in the Gospel of John, there was a guy brought back to life. Anybody know who that was? 
Lazarus was brought back to life. And so what was the two main things that set the context just before Jesus rides into Jerusalem? It was that the blind could see and the dead could be raised. Now, is that saying something to you and I today? Could it be that the context of Jesus riding into Jerusalem is so that our eyes could be open to who he is and that realize that he was going to give his life, he was going to die so that we could live, amen? And I want to tell you something, that message is for you and I today. It was for them as well, but as we read here, there's, there's a duplicate message. It was for the people of that day, but it's also for you and I right now. So with that in mind, here, here's point one, uh, you know, this, the seven truths about Jesus. And the first one is, Jesus rode in on a donkey. And you're like, well, really? That's an important truth? Yeah, it really is. Now the thing is, uh, Jesus rode in on a donkey, you might say, well, look, at in modern days, he would ride in on a Chevrolet or a Ford or, you know, a Lexus or, you know, whatever. It, you know, who cares? But here's the thing, the donkey was more than a vehicle, it was a statement. And what we need to understand is actually to go back in time. If you look at the book of Judges in the Old Testament especially, the rulers of that day would go from town to town and they would ride on donkeys. And what happened is when you saw the donkey coming into town with that judge on it, they represented peace and justice. In other words, if you had a, a quarrel with your neighbor or something was going on that you needed straightened out, when that righteous judge, when that peacemaker came to town, he would fix everything and make it right. And so we can see that now then, when Jesus specifically asked for a donkey, there was reason for it. Not only to fulfill prophecy, in fact, one part of it in verse 5 says, you know, tell the daughter of Zion, behold, the king is coming to you, lowly and sitting on a donkey, the colt, the foal of a donkey. That's taken from Zechariah. And so Jesus was fulfilling scripture in riding that donkey into town. And so here, here's what we have to say then, when, when he went and said to his disciples, ask for the donkey, go get it. We can read in another account, the people actually said, why are you taking our donkey? It's like Grand Theft Auto today. It'd be like if somebody come up and was trying to get into your car to take your car, you're like, whoa, 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 that, that's not your car. And so they said, well, Jesus has need of it. And they let him take them. They let the disciples take him. Well, why? To fulfill prophecy. And those people understood that, that were there listening. You might say, well, well how, how would they know? Well, it was in that very town that blind had been healed, that the dead had been raised. They knew Jesus was going to be the coming king. And so they were more than happy to lend the donkey because it fulfilled the scriptures. And so as Jesus gets on that donkey and begins to ride, ride in, you know, there was a bunch of people, right? And they're shouting, right, Hosanna in the highest, you know, all, all of that. Well, where did those people come from? Because we just read that as he got into town, as he got into Jerusalem, that all the people were stirred. So who were the people that were all excited, you know, putting the palm leaves out and, and doing all those things in the clothes? Let me tell you who they were. They were the people in Bethany and Bethpage. Why? Because they had seen what Jesus has done. Let me tell you something. I don't need to stir excitement in you about Jesus if you've had a personal encounter with him. And those people had had an encounter with Jesus. They had seen blind and, and different other miracles happen. And they had seen Lazarus, who they knew was dead, four days in the tomb, come back to life. And they knew, man, this Jesus is the real deal. But up until this time, he was keeping a low profile, wasn't he? If you read the Gospel of John, over and over again, he would do miraculous things like the feeding of the 5,000 and other miracles. And it would say that the people there tried to make him king. And what does the word say? In the Gospel of John, it says this, but his hour had not yet come. And yet, just before this account here in the Gospel of John, before the triumphal entry, it says his hour had come. What was the hour to come? What was it? He was riding into Jerusalem on a donkey saying, I am your king. That's literally what he was saying. Now, he could have rode in on a horse, right? He could have rode in on a cart. It wouldn't have represented the same thing. He was fulfilling prophecy and demonstrating he was the king of kings and lord of lords. That brings us to the second point, and it's this, that Jesus was misunderstood the children there, and everyone was shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Right, that word Hosanna, you know, you know what that means? Come save us now. That's literally what Hosanna means. That sounds pretty good, right? Come save us now. And the thing is, when we look back on it, we understand the meaning of it, right? To come save us from our sins, to deliver us and give us eternal life. How many people would think it that way? 
Well, back in that day, when they were saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. You know what they were saying? Come deliver us from the Romans. You know, come as king. Kick Herod out. Kick the Romans out. And come and sit on the throne and reign over us. That's what they were believing and thinking as Jesus was coming into town. Do you know that that message is still preached today at times? In that someone is led to Jesus and they're told, look it, all of your problems are going to go away. Anything that's wrong in your life will just totally be fixed and, and you're just going to have this yellow brick road kind of life now because Jesus is in your life. Let me tell you something, that's a lie. That's, that's the same thing as what these people were believing there, that Jesus was just going to change all the material, natural things in the world. Let me tell you something, you know what he's primarily come to change? Your heart and my heart. That's what he came to do. Not all these other things. And so often, I think we're still a bit messed up when Jesus rides into our life. We're thinking, okay, politically, you're going to fix this and fix that and do this and do that. And the thing is, when it doesn't happen, guess what happens to you and I? We become like the crowd a week later, the same crowd who shouts, crucify him. The same crowd who rejects Jesus because he didn't fulfill the qualifications that they thought he should. But the question is, are we willing to come to a place of believing him. And so let's go back to this. It's just so, so, so important. He was misunderstood. Do you and I misunderstand him sometimes? And I believe that we do. And we need to come back to that place of recognizing that he came first to save us from our sins. Why is this more important? Because it's for all of eternity. What if Jesus came today and fixed all the political stuff? Now, I don't know how we could do that because we all have so many different opinions, right? But let's just say we all had the same opinion and he fixed it all. Okay, fixed it all, exactly the way it should be. What's going to happen a week from now? Two weeks from now, three weeks from now? My point is, it's a, it's a never-ending thing, right? It's like the, you know, the election cycle every four years. You know, just, it just ramps up. So here's the thing. That's important, but not as important as Jesus and following him. Now think about this. Jesus lived in an occupied Israel. A foreign nation was ruling over them. Is there one scripture where Jesus talks about it and says that they should be overthrown. There's not one scripture about it. And they were an occupied country. Now, does that mean Jesus didn't care? No, he cared very much, and you need to understand this. I'm not saying that we don't be involved, but we need to focus on him first and eternity and then ask God to help us. Here's my point. If we made everyone do what we think God should have done, that's just changing the outside, isn't it? But if you and I are changed by Jesus on the inside. Here's what we do. We then go be a light to our world, our sphere of influence. And as that person that we lead to Christ begins to change on the inside, you know what happens? A changed heart means a changed life, and a changed life means a changed community. That's how it works. You can't conform people to do what Jesus wants them to do, but we're transformed by what the renewing of our minds and our hearts in Christ Jesus. It begins on the inside. And so if you're fighting to try to change, you know, politics and the way things are done on the outside and trying to get people to change on the outside, I got news for you. Unless their heart changes, they will never change. Just as you and I wouldn't change until Jesus came in. Now, I wish that the minute Jesus comes in, we're perfect. How many people kind of like that? I got news for you. It's a daily walk with Jesus to be changed on a daily basis, amen? And so we allow that to happen. In fact, that's what this whole sermon is about. Jesus rode once into Jerusalem, but here's what I'm trying to tell you. He's riding into our lives daily and wanting to bring transition to us, bring change to us, and to help us and aid us in our walk. That's, that's really the message, top and bottom. He really wants to change us. And so that brings me to the uh, third point, but we have to read a scripture about this. And it's in Luke 19. And again, it's following the same story, okay? So in Luke 19, verse 41. Now as he drew near, near to Jerusalem, Jesus saw the city and wept over it, saying, if you had known, even you especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For days will come when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you and close in on you every side and level you and your children within you to the ground. They will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. 
So the first thing that comes to me is this. Jesus cares a lot. That's point three. It says that he wept over the city. Now that doesn't mean that as he's riding in, just a couple tears kind of sprinkled down. And he's like, oh, you know, just feeling bad. The, that word in the original language means to wail. In other words, he's wailing over what's going to happen. Why? Because he has 2020 vision, right, for what's going to happen then and what's going to happen a thousand years from now. And as he's looking at Jerusalem, he's weeping and wailing over it. Why? Because they were unwilling to see the peace that he was bringing. In fact, the scripture says specifically, right, that especially in your day, the things that make for your peace. In other words, Jesus is the Prince of Peace, and they were unwilling or unable to see it. If you remember the context, Jesus brought blind eyes to be able to see. And here he is wanting them to be able to see who he really was. Are you letting Jesus bring peace into every area of your life? You might say, well, I'm a Christian. You know, I've got the peace of God in me that passes all understanding. No, no, listen to me. Have you got the peace of God in every circumstance and every situation in your life? It's easy to make it, you know, make kind of like that statement, I got the peace of God that passes all understanding. It's good, good scripture. But do you really? Do you lay at night worrying about certain things? Or during the daytime, all concerned about something? Are you letting God's peace ride into that part? Are you willing to submit and let him touch you and change you so it no longer becomes your burden, but his burden? That's just so, so important. Why? Because he cares a lot. If you're concerned about it, he's concerned about it as well. And it's time. Some of you, listen, this is what the Lord's telling me in the spirit right now. Some of you are carrying burdens that God hasn't called you to carry. Or you've been carrying it, and he's saying, give that to me. Come on to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. I will give you rest. Well, what's that talking about? And in Peter, it says, cast your cares upon the Lord, for he cares for you. The idea is that you don't have to carry this thing anymore, and you can hand it to him. And for some of you, the enemy comes along and says, well, then that means you don't care anymore. In other words, to carry that weight makes it feel like you're doing something. Can I tell you something? That's actually a type of pride and arrogance. But when you give it over to him, you're doing what? You're surrendering to him. And you're saying, Lord, I give this to you. And when you do that, Jesus then gives you a light burden to carry. And you know what that burden is? Trusting in him. Just like that one song we say. That's your, your job and my job is to trust in him. Amen? Okay, so Jesus cares a lot. Here's the next thing. Part of this scripture as well. Jesus knows what's coming. He, at the very end of that scripture, he says, because you didn't know the day of your visitation, all these bad things are going to happen. And it did. Some 40 years after Jesus rode into Jerusalem, after he gave his life and ascended into heaven, all of Jerusalem was trashed. Literally one stone wasn't left upon another. The whole thing was ragged. You might say, they even took the stones apart? Yeah, they did, because when the temple was built, there was gold leaf between the stones so there wouldn't be any cracks. So literally when the Romans came and, and took over and wrecked everything, they took the gold leaf so every stone had to come apart. It's horrendous what happened. And Jesus knew that it was going to happen. And why did it happen? He said, because you didn't know the day of your visitation. Jesus is visiting us right here, right now. He's right here right now. Why? Because we've set time aside. We're reading his word. We're saying praises to who he is. The Bible says that God inhabits the praises of his people. He's here. He's visiting right now, riding by your life right now, just on that donkey. And what he wants to do is have some interaction with you. Now, how do I know that? Well, let's just read the, the last portion of scripture here. And I'm back over to Matthew. Matthew 21 beginning at verse 12. Then Jesus went into the temple of God and drove out all those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he said to them, it is written, my house should be called a house of prayer, but you've made it a den of thieves. Then the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did and the children crying out in the temple saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant and said to him, do you not hear what they are saying? And Jesus said to them, yes, have you never read that out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants you have perfected praise? And he left them and went out of the city to Bethany and lodged there. So here it begins where Jesus cleanses the temple. He cleansed the temple twice. 
according to the Word of God. When he first started his ministry, three and a half years before, and then at the end. And I think that's symbolic for you and I that when Jesus first comes into our life, there's a house cleaning that happens, but that, that there's an ongoing house cleaning through our lives. And there's going to be a final house cleaning before he comes back for us. See, we're not perfect. Any, any perfect people here? You notice my hand's not up. I got some people wondering, do I put my hand up or not? Is this a trick question? No, let me tell you something. There's no perfect people here, but I pray that all of you have been saved from your sins. In other words, that God has delivered you and you have a place in heaven, amen? But that me, our mind is still being renewed. We still do things wrong. And I believe that just when we cross from this life to the next, there's a final house cleaning where all the garbage gets taken out and we pass into heaven perfect and complete. How many people want that, amen? And that, yeah, no trick question to that. You, you want your hand up for that, amen. And so that leads me to my uh, fifth point, right? Uh, and it's this, that Jesus wants to talk with you think about this. He said the temple, they were all doing all kinds of buying and selling. And he said, it shouldn't be that. It should be what? A house of prayer. So here's the thing. It's not talking about church. It's talking about the temple, which you and I are. The Bible says that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. In other words, because God dwells in us, Jesus is right here, right? And so basically, here's what the Lord is telling us for today, is that we're not just to live a life of commerce, not a life of just doing stuff and just experiencing life, but there needs to be time set aside that our temple is a house of prayer, where basically you and I are interacting with God on a regular basis, because that's the heart of Jesus. Let me tell you something, if you do that, your whole life will be changed. So you're saying, well, that means like my whole life, I got to be like on my knees by my bed. You know, what about my job? What about school? What about this? I'm not suggesting that at all. But here's what I will tell you. If you're spending zero time with God in prayer and you begin to take 10 minutes a day, it would be life changing. And if you're taking 10 minutes a day, I promise you, if you make it 20 minutes a day, it will be life changing. You hear what I'm saying? That the more room you give for Jesus, the more he can do in your life. And I've seen this over and over in my life. And, and for some, I've had them come to me and say, you know, I did what you said. You know, I, I spent 10 minutes and I spent 20 minutes and, and I got nothing. I'm like, oh, really? Really? Well, tell me a little bit about your experience. And they would share and, you know, and, and, and I said, well, what about the rest of the day? And they go, well, yeah, you know, there was some weird things that happened that, you know, I just seemed to have more peace and, you know, that happened and this happened over here and it was really good and, and God spoke to me. I'm like, oh, do you think there might be a connection there? You know, because so often we think that, that God's like, it's like a telephone kind of thing. Hey, God, kind of like my, my granddaughter and me, right? We're going back and forth. But it wasn't, it's not always like that. You know, you're talking, you're kind of listening, and you're reading the scriptures. But you don't always get clarity always at that moment. But because you take the time to do that an hour later, three hours, five hours later, all of a sudden, God moves. Or, or you've opened your heart for that 20 minutes, and all of a sudden, you know what the voice of the Spirit is. And you sense what to say or what to do. Or how about this for me most of the time? What not to say or what not to do. Usually that's me, all right? <laughs> I'm, I'm the one, you know, rushing and Hey, we should do this. Or that. And, and the thing is, God helps you with those things. I promise you that God wants to talk to you. Not just special people. We're all special to him, amen? All right, so let's move on. How about this? Jesus, number six, we're almost finished. Jesus was rejected by the religious leaders. And let me tell you something, if there's a religious bone in your body, you're going to have a struggle with Jesus at times, because he breaks the mold of a religion. And what do I mean by that? Listen, we all have, if you've been around any length of time, and especially if you were part of any kind of church system, you all have some religion in you. How many people come from a background of religion? My hand's up. Yeah. Let me tell you something, that has an impact on your life even after you have a personal relationship with the Lord because it's been ingrained. You know, you do certain things you did for years and years and, and you have to come to a point of realizing that God breaks every mold. Now, he never goes against his word, but he breaks the mold of religion. If you catch yourself ever saying, Jesus wouldn't do it that way, you need to stop for a minute and look at the scriptures and if it doesn't go against the scriptures, yeah, he could do it that way. He can do anything, amen? And are you open to that happening? This brings us to the final point. And I love this. If you look at, let me just re reinterify. In verse 14, Matthew 21, then the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. I love this. Jesus came to bring healing. And that word healing is interesting. In the original language, in the Greek, it's Therapeo, it's where we get the term therapy. 
He literally wants to be concerned about you to bring you to a place of healing. That's the heart of God today. It's always been that way, isn't it? The question is, are we allowing him to heal us completely? I, I was just thinking about this. I, I hurt my, years ago, I jumped off a, a wagon. It was stupid anyways, and, and about five feet. And I, my ankle, I busted a bunch of bones in my foot. And so, you know, I come from a different world in a sense. I come from rural Canada. You know, I'm sure all of you here would run to the doctor and all that. We didn't do that on the farm. It's like, can you still walk? Well, yeah, sort of. Okay, keep working. You know, that, that's the world I came from, all right? So six months goes by, and I'm still hobbling around. I remember my father and my mother said to me, what's wrong with you? And I'm like, nothing's wrong with me. But I still had this, this limp. And, and I had to think about it and say, well, I guess I developed that limp when I hurt that bone. But the bone's been healed. It doesn't hurt anymore. And so I had to literally relearn to walk normal again. And the thing is, sometimes that's you and I. Jesus has brought healing. He's brought therapy to you. But you're still walking with a limp because you haven't relearned or retrained yourself. And so you're still crippled. You get what I mean? You're still walking with that limp. But it's been healed. You hear what I'm saying? And you have to come to that place of letting Jesus complete the work that he's begun. And the word says that he that began a good work in you will complete it. Amen. That's the God that we serve today. I'm going to ask Lorez to come up because we're going to close uh, with prayer today. You know, if you notice, we didn't pray at the start. Here's why. My heart is that you respond to this message today. In fact, I'd just like everyone to stand up and we're just going to talk just for a few moments and then we're going to pray for people. There's two groups of people here today. The first group is this, that you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. But here's something I want you to know. Jesus is riding by your life right here, right now. And he wants to have a conversation with you. Now for me, it took a couple of those visits. I remember I was in grade three, had a visitation from Jesus. I remember it as plain as day. And that was a long time ago, folks. And then I remember about three years before I got saved, I was on the farm and it was dark out and I was feeding calves and calf hutches with these giant baby bottles. How many people have seen a picture of that or you know what I'm talking about, right? So I'm feeding it and I'm looking up at the sky and it was one of those cloudless nights and it was in the winter time and the stars were brilliant. You got to understand, out in the farm there's no artificial lights. It's brilliant. And I'm looking at it and the Lord spoke to me. He rode by and he said, son, don't you see me in all this? Now the thing is, I was going to church. I've been going to church since I was a little kid. And so here, here, here's the stupid conversation I had, all right? Not stupid on God's part, my part. I'm like, yeah, Jesus, I, I, yeah, I know you made everything. Yeah, we're cool. All's good. I'm going to church. It's all fine. Carried on, went back, you know, back to work again. But what Jesus was really saying is, do you want to know me personally? Not know about me. The Bible says even the devil knows about God and, and shivers about it. But to know him personally. So if you're here in this place and you've never invited Jesus personally into your life. In other words, to say, Lord, I'm not perfect. I know I'm not going to get to heaven on my own merit. And let me tell you something. No matter what you do, you'll never be good enough to get to heaven on your own. None of us can be. But with Jesus' help, with his sacrifice on the cross of Calvary, you can get to heaven. Make that decision right now. Close your eyes. Lord, right now, anyone here within the sound of my voice, those watching online, if there's anyone that has never received you, accepted you, as their Savior and as their Lord. I pray they do it right now in Jesus' name. Make that decision. Don't wait in case this might be the last ride through, Lord God. We don't know our day or hour that, that our end will come. So, Lord, if you're talking to them, let this be the day that they accept you. Amen. I want to talk to the rest of you now. Jesus is into multiple visitations. You know, the first one is for salvation, right? That's, but let me tell you something. He wants to visit us on a daily basis. Well, here's what I do believe. That right now, today, he's visiting you because he wants to do something new in your life. And the question is, are you willing to let him? One of our leaders came up for, uh, you know, at the same time, you know, earlier, came up for prayer. And normally they're praying for people. And that leader stood up here and I was able to talk to him and say, what do you need prayer for? He said, I just want more. And that could be some of you here. You know, you may be a leader here in church. You may think, oh, well, that, that's, that's uh, beneath me to get prayer. Let me tell you something. You're never beneath having an encounter with Jesus. 
My God, we all want an encounter. How many people want an encounter with Jesus? Amen. Sometimes part of that encounter means responding. And so what we're going to do, there's going to be a song that's going to be sung so people can engage in that if they want to. But if you want to have an encounter with Jesus riding by your life right now, then I just invite you to come up to the front area here. We'll pray for you and believe God that you will experience him in a way just like the people in Bethany and Bethpage experienced the healings that they saw. That your life will be transformed by the presence of Jesus this morning. And let me tell you something, when that happens, it's like a it's like a, a, a mile marker that gets marked in your life that, that you'll never, ever forget. So I encourage you. Some of you are hurting right now. Some of you are walking with a limp right now spiritually. Others are, are dealing with doubt and, and unbelief. Others got circumstances that are way above anything you can imagine. But whatever it is, Jesus is riding by to help you right now. So I encourage you, come forward. Don't be shy to come to Jesus. In fact, in one of the songs, we say, whoever comes to him, he will answer. And sometimes walking forward, just coming forward, demonstrates to the Lord, I'm serious about this. Amen. So let's just do that. Go ahead, Lewis. Then I'll close in prayer at the end. Thank you, Jesus. Cool, thank you. Jesus is mine. He's been my father. Time after time, born of his spirit, washed in his blood, and what he did for me on Calvary is more than enough. And I trust in God.
For those receiving prayer, just please continue to get prayed for. Just think of the words of that song. He will never, ever fail. Lord, I thank you that you were faithful. Lord God, I thank you for all that you've done for us. I thank you you rode into Jerusalem, but you're still riding into our lives this very day. And Lord, I look forward to all the other times you're going to ride into our lives in the days and weeks and months and years to come. Lord, I thank you you're there for each and every one of us. So Lord, we surrender to you today. We surrender to you every day of our lives. Lord, I thank you for your faithfulness. So bless each one as they put you as a priority, Lord God, as they walk in the truths of who you really are. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. God bless you today. And in fact, uh, just so you know, if you have a look around at our flowers, we've got a couple that are just coming into bloom. Those seeds you planted are, are going to be a harvest in another few weeks. God bless you. I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. I sought the Lord.